We are going into our Book of Romans part two in our series. If you weren't here last week, you need to jump on part one. It's on the YouTube channel. It's on Facebook. We're going into part two. If you're following along, we're using the New King James, the Book of Romans, one of my favorite books in the Bible, written by the Apostle Paul to the believers in Rome. And what makes the Book of Romans so powerful and so different than the other books of the Bible is that it presents the entire counsel of God in one book. All the essential Christian doctrines that we need to know are found in the Book of Romans. So this is why it's so essential, why it's so powerful. We're going to go through a lot of doctrine. And then towards the end of the book of Roman, we're going to go into practical how to apply it to our lives. So let me give those of you that are jumping in here, make sure you're liking and sharing. Let me give you a little bit of a recap. And again, where I'm going to be at, don't worry, I'll post those events. Just know those are the months I'm going to be there. When I get the venue locked in, I'll post it. I know a lot of you are spamming in the chat. Where in Georgia, where here? I'll post them as soon as I have the venues. But for those of you just jumping on, let me give you a little bit of a recap of chapters one and two. We find that the gospel is Paul's deepest motivation to them for his ministry. Paul understands that the way that God is going to reach a broken, dark, evil, sinful world is through the gospel. Paul says, I am unashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God into salvation. So the, the gospel is essential to the book of Romans and essential to the Christian faith. You need to know the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that a real man, Jesus Christ, came from heaven left eternity, entered humanity, wrapped himself in flesh, was born of a virgin, died on a cross. The story doesn't end at the death. Three days later, he rose from the grave, sends his Holy Spirit to live inside of his believers. And now we have seen this global movement called Christianity where Jesus lives inside his believers through the person of the Holy Spirit. That's the gospel message in essence. But that was a very powerful motivator to Paul's ministry. We also find out that God does not immediately judge all sin, but will eventually judge sin. So there's often times where people sin in thinking that because God has not judged their sin, that they've gotten away with their sin. But Paul makes it clear in Romans that just because you're not judged immediately doesn't mean you won't be judged eventually. That's a good word right there. Paul also makes it clear in the beginning of Romans. Again, I'm just catching you guys up before we jump into chapter two here. Paul also all makes Paul also makes it clear that creation shouts out that God is real and that nobody has an excuse to say God isn't real or God didn't reveal himself to me because literally creation, nature, trees, stars, the moon, animals, all these things, biology, they speak to the existence of God. As David said, the universe, the stars, they cry out that God is alive, that God is real, that creation speaks of God's existence. So those that say God isn't real, God has never revealed himself, you got to realize something that they're only, only a fool says in his heart, there is no God, but God has made himself, according to Romans, plainly known, okay? Paul also says that God turns people over to a reprobate mind when they continue to live unrighteously, when they have unrighteous living. And also, when we keep on sinning, after coming to the knowledge of God, we're storing up wrath for ourselves. So as Christians, you continue on. The unbeliever, God says, I turn you over to a reprobate mind. The Christian, if we keep on sinning, we think God's not going to judge us. The Bible says that that sin is stored up as wrath. And that there's a day of wrath, a day of judgment where God will pour out wrath even on those who think they're a Christian, they're safe, and they live their lives in sin. So it's not a game, it's not a joke. Do not play with sin. So that was Romans 1 and 2. We're picking up in Romans chapter 2, verse 17. Chapter 2, verse 16, to our last verse we did was that God will judge the secrets of men. So nobody's getting away from it. God is a real judge, a real God that judges with wrath and that God will judge secrets. So there's no such thing as hiding your sin from God. God will judge you. So if you're following Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 24, it says this, Indeed, you are called a Jew, and the rest and rest on the law, and make your boast in God, and know his will, and approve of the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor to the foolish, a teacher of the babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. So he's talking to the Jews. You, therefore, who teach another, do you teach yourself? Let me say that again. Paul says, you, therefore, who teach others, do you not, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. As it is written. So what Paul is doing is he's turning his attention to the Jew. Jews of his day had a great deal of confidence because they knew more about moral matters than the rest of humankind. And they knew more because God had given them the law before he gave it to anyone else. So before 
anybody had the law, the Jews had the law. What Paul is saying here is you teach others the law, and this is so convicting as a preacher of the word. He goes, you teach others the law, but the question is, do you even uphold the same law that you teach? In other words, like you teach others to have a prayer life, but do you have a prayer life? You teach others not to worship idols, but do you worship idols? You teach others to fast, but do you fast? You teach others that they should live by God's laws, God's standards. And again, I'm relaying it to a New Testament reality. But Paul says, you don't even keep it yourself. So you you have it, but he says, make sure you're keeping it. Now, Jews believe that in the law, they had the embody, embodiment of all knowledge and truth. Many of the Jews rejected Jesus because of the law. They go, I have the law. We know it's right. Everybody else is wrong. And the problem was this. Though the Jews had the law, they didn't keep the law. And so Paul points out, points out to the Jews hypocrisy by asking a series of questions. He wants the Jews to look at themselves for who they are and the Jews were who, and the Jews being those that were breaking the law that they were so proud of. And in case we're te tempted to think, oh, those first century Jews, how could they? We could also remind ourselves of the own skeletons we have lurking in our closet. Now, I don't want to be self-righteous. I don't want to sit here and say, oh, look at all these bad sinners out there doing this and not look at my own life and say, wait a minute, there's also skeletons lurking in my closet, think areas of my life that I need to get right with God. And so I don't just want to point my finger at everybody else. Paul is asking them questions so that they will look at their own hypocrisy and the words that Paul gives to the Jews are just as much relevant to us today that we must examine our own lives and make sure that we don't have a holier than thou attitude. This is all about living a holy life, pleasing to God and not pointing our fingers at others for certain sins that we think are worse than our sins. Now, if we are living a clean, holy, pure life, walking circumspect, consecrated before God, which we should be, which I believe I am, then we should be able to teach, preach, and judge. The issue is, if I'm living, let's just example, if I'm living right now in unrighteousness, and I'm watching filthy things, listening to filthy things, watching pornography, and I'm doing all this, and I'm getting up and preaching to you guys, we need to live sin-free and lust-free. That's hypocrisy. That's what the Bible says don't do. It's not saying don't judge people. It's saying don't judge people unrighteously when you're sinning the same things they're doing, you're doing. This was the problem with the Jews. They were breaking the laws, but they were judging the Gentiles because the Jews were circumcised. They were saying, you guys are sinners because you're uncircumcised. And Paul's about to show us here. It's not at all what's going on. So Romans 2, 25 to 26. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? So some of these sound very complicated and complex. My goal tonight is to break down these doctrines basically simply so you understand them. So Paul is saying this, if you're circumcised, but you break the law, you're now uncircumcised. And if you're uncircumcised and you keep the law, that would count you as circumcised. Circumcision was an outward sign of a covenant relationship with God. In the context of that covenant relationship with God, God's people were called to walk with him, worship him, and obey him. And Paul told the Jews, circumcision without obedience was meaningless. In other words, these acts that you're doing, these rituals, whether it's circumcision, baptism, communion, we'll go into that after, he goes, if you're not obeying God and you're not walking in the law, then those are useless. They're just rituals if you're not living it. So how does that relate to us? We go to church and worship and praise and do community, get baptized and do all these things. But then we go through our week breaking God's laws. We live lawless like we don't have no standard. There's no master. We can do what we want. And what Paul is saying, just like the Jews who were circumcised were breaking God's law, counting them as uncircumcised. What about us? that live like however we want all week and then go do rituals at church thinking somehow we're fine. And Paul says, no, no, it's these, these things we do like prayer and communion and baptism, these th things that are good are meaningless if we don't live a transformed life. So Paul told the Jews circumcision without obedience was meaningless. Paul had to part ways with his fellow Jews on the topic of circumcision. For the Jews, circumcision was the covenant. But Paul believed what scripture taught. Circumcision wasn't the covenant. 
It was the sign of the covenant. So I'm not circumcised. That's not the covenant was the circumcision. The circumcision was they were circumcised. A Jew would be circumcised was the sign of the covenant with God. That was a cutting away separation of uncleanliness and all that. So circumcision was affirmation that the covenant continued from generation to generation, but circumcision had no power to save. Just like the law, which I'm going to show you. And I love this doctrine stuff here, but just like the law had no power to save, circumcision had no power to save. Paul's view of circumcision was it had value, but it couldn't bring justification to a sinner and it was never intended to save us as the Jews thought. We struggle with similar issues in the church today. Many of us practice the rituals of faith, being things like baptism, communion, reciting prayers at church, worship and these things, but, and we know about God, but our hearts are unchanged. So they're useless. It's useless to get baptized with an unchanged heart when you're not going to change your life. It's like someone says, I'll get baptized, but I don't plan to serve God. The baptism's useless because the ritual of baptism is a sign of repentance. Communion. Paul says, don't take it in an unworthy manner. If I'm just living for myself and sinning and doing whatever I want and I'm in the world and I take communion because I just got drugged to church, it's meaningless because the ritual, again, has no power if there's not a heart change. So we cannot be saved by works. Someone type that in the chat. We cannot be saved by works or rituals. We are saved by repenting of our sins and putting our faith in Christ and letting his Holy Spirit change our lives. Salvation is a free gift. And Paul's going to show us this. Romans 2.27. And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills a law, judge you, even with your written code and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law. So Paul says, the uncircumcised physically who fulfill the law are going to judge you who are circumcised, but are transgressors of the law. Again, Paul is reiterating, it's not about rituals or doing certain things. It's about actually living it out. So the rituals are not saving in themselves. I know there's many people that are going to turn me off and get mad about this, but it's biblical baptism is not a means to salvation you don't get saved because you get baptized you get saved because you put your faith in jesus that's why in acts i believe it's 10 cornelius's family got the holy spirit before they were baptized so if you're in the chat and you're getting mad saying oh no you have to get baptized or you can't be saved and then cornelius's family had the holy spirit but they weren't saved because the bible says as peter preached they the holy spirit came upon them validating that god was saving the gentiles and then they got baptized. Same thing in Acts 2.38, repent. Okay, so we have to repent. So these works are great. Baptism, amazing. Communion, amazing. Prayer, amazing. All of us should get baptized. All of us should take communion. All of us should pray and worship and be a part of a church. But without faith in Christ, these things do not save you. In other words, you can't just get baptized and think that's going to save you when you don't put your faith in Jesus Christ. So yes, we get baptized. Yes, Jesus commands us. Yes, Paul, even though Paul said, I didn't come to baptize people. Another argument there. Why did Paul say, I didn't come to baptize if baptism is the way to salvation when Paul preached the gospel of salvation everywhere he went? Again, I have a video on baptism requirement to salvation, but we're not saved on works. The Bible makes this clear. We are saved on faith in Jesus. And then we do the works like baptism, like communion, like prayer, like having fruit in our lives. And this, that's the biblical order if you read the book of Acts and if you also look at the Gospels. Romans 2, 28 through 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor a circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. In the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Okay, so I know it sounds complicated. I'm going to break it down very simply. Paul says there's this new circumcision, and it's the circumcision of the heart, and that is the spirit, not the letter. So the spirit circumcises our heart. We don't have the letter to go get physically circumcised. So Paul, with these verses, is going to wrap up his discussion of the law and of circumcision. Merely knowing the law was not enough to be in God's favor. Circumcision by itself pay attention here, did not have the power to save, Paul says, okay? God was concerned with the heart and the spirit circumcises the heart. Paul wasn't forbidding circumcision, an ancient Jewish covenant, covenantal right, but Paul was interested in establishing its purpose in a greater light of the mission that God had for humanity, and that was the circumcision of the heart. So Paul's not saying don't get circumcised, okay? It's not a sin to get circumcised. Many people to this day get circumcised. Awesome, great, cool. But Paul wasn't saying doing away with it. Paul was saying there's a greater reality, and that is the circumcision of the heart, and that is by the Spirit. So we're not requiring you to get circumcised now. When the Gentiles got saved, we knew in the book of Acts through our teaching, Paul and them came to the conclusion if you're a gentile and you're not circumcised 
You don't need to go get circumcised to get saved, okay? We're going to do away with that. It's not a requirement for salvation. And these Jews thought if they knew the law, they were saved. But Paul shows us the law is not salvific in nature. What is salvific? I, I hate to use big words. I try not to. Salvific means leading to salvation. The law does not lead to salvation. The law does not save. It's not salvific. It doesn't save people. It's the spirit of God that saves. It's repentance. It's faith in Jesus. The law can't do it, which we're going to go into the law here in a minute. The grace of the law is that it enables us to do our to see ourselves as God sees us. This is the grace of the law. Why is the law important? The law lets us see ourselves as sinful. It lets us see ourselves as God sees us. God sees us as sinful until we put our faith in Jesus. The way we know that we're sinful is because we have the law. Now, when you get the Holy Spirit, you don't need the law because the Holy Spirit convicts you. So you don't need to read the law and go, oh, I'm wrong. The Holy Spirit, this is good preaching. Come on, type one. The Holy Spirit convicts us so we know what is right and what is wrong. That's what the Bible says. We don't need anybody to judge us. We ourselves can judge ourselves because we walk in the Spirit, not in the law. So that's what the law did. It showed us that we were needy, we were sinful, and we needed salvation. Okay, so let's wrap up chapter two because I'm going to try to go through chapter three and forward tonight um, by the grace of God. But chapter two, when we pass judgment on someone else, we have three ping fingers pointing back at ourselves. These sin their other people's sins are only different expressions of the, our own sin. That's this chapter two wrap up. If a man fails to repent and remain stubborn, he's storing up wrath for the day of judgment. So if you, you're a Christian, you don't repent, you stay stubborn, you're storing up wrath in the day of judgment. Paul reminds the church that God does not show favoritism. If we do evil, we store up wrath. Whether you say you're a Christian or not, God doesn't show favoritism. God will still store that wrath up even if you say you're a Christian. Both Jews and Gentiles are sinners. The Jews violate God's law and the Gentiles violate their conscience. So remember in Acts chapter, I'm sorry, in Romans 2, he goes, even though the Gentiles don't have the law, they violate their conscience. And because they know they're violating their conscience, it's proof that they're breaking God's law. The Jews have the law, so they know they're in sin. The Gentiles have the conscience. When they break it, they know that they're also in sin. The Jews were hypocritical in that they thought they had the law, even though they didn't keep it. Outward signs, and this is what we just covered, outward signs are nothing without inward realities. Truly being part of God's family depends on not rituals, but devotion to God and obedience to his word. So again, it's not the rituals, it's not the works, the things we do that save us, it's faith in Jesus. And if it makes you mad, you go read the Bible and go come back with a different conclusion because I'm just telling you what Paul is teaching here and I'm literally going verse by verse. So for those of you that are mad, I'm going verse by verse here. Romans chapter three. If you have your Bibles, we're going to Romans 3 now. Many of you follow along. Um, awesome. Romans 3 verses 1 through 2. What advantage then has the Jew or what is the profit of circumcision? And then Paul says, much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. So Paul says, after Paul, it seems, it feels like is like railing against the Jews. Like you guys aren't special. Paul contrasts it with what do they have an advantage over the Gentile and what profit is there in circumcision? And Paul says much in every way. There's absolute benefit, Paul is saying, to those that are Jews because Paul knew his Jewish readers were going to ask the question after reading what he said about them in the first two chapters. Paul's like, man, first two chapters, you guys were just going at, uh, Paul's, Paul's going at them. And Paul says this, if the Jews and the Gentiles stood on a level playing field, what advantage does the Jew have? Paul's response is a positive one. They have an advantage much in every way. In Paul's view being appointed the uh, guardians of God's word was the chief advantage of being the of being a Jew. They could know the will of God and they had access to who to God whose will it was. So because they had the law, Paul says, "Yes, there's an advantage. You guys were trusted and trusted by God, the oracles of God. You were given the law and you were chosen as God's holy people." But remember, now that we're in the new covenant, God no longer says, it's just for the Jews, these are my people. God says, "Anyone who puts their faith in Christ their heart now is circumcised, and now they become a son and daughter of God. So you don't have to be a special Jew or a special race. God sees path as an, past ethnicity, cultures, and all these uh, statuses that he once looked at. Romans chapter 3, verses 3 through 4. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true and every man a liar. As it is written that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. So Paul says this in chapter two, points out all the, that the, although the Jews were circumcised outwardly, 
only some had circumcised hearts by the Spirit. In other words, only some of the Jews were faithful to God. Many of the Jews at this time still rejected God, still rejected Jesus. And upon hearing this, a Jew might ask, so does that mean that God was unfaithful to the Jews who were not faithful? So like God says, I'll be faithful to the Jews. All these Jews that rejected Jesus was God being unfaithful towards them because they were unfaithful towards him. Paul's answer is one of the strongest expressions in the New Testament, and his answer is certainly not. And the King James, this ver ver this translates to God forbid. If you read the King James Version, it says God forbid. What Paul is saying that if a certain Jew is not faithful to God, that's not God's fault. God never stopped being faith faithful just because we're not faithful. Choosing not to follow God is the fault of the person that makes the choice. So the Jews were saying, well, is God unfaithful then because, you know, all these Jews rejected him? Paul is saying, no, that's their choice to reject God, but it doesn't speak to the faithfulness of God. We often blame God for not being there for us. But in reality, when we say, God, where were you? Or God, where are you? God responds back to us, where were you? Where were you? I, you were nowhere to be found. You were ignoring me, even in our rebellion, even in our unbelief, our doubt, our bitterness, our complacency, our lack of pursuing God. God remains open and continues to keep the door open to us and pursues us. The Bible says, while well, we were sinners, Christ died for us. The only way we could even love God is because he first loved us. The story of Christ is that he died for those that were that spit in his face. I can look back on the darkest moments of my life where I was completely unfaithful, running from God, and God was there the entire time waiting for me to come back to him. What Paul is saying is just because you're unfaithful to God, come on, somebody needs to hear this tonight doesn't mean God is unfaithful. Life is about choices and God will not force himself on you. You have to choose today that you're going to serve God. The Jews faithfulness to the old covenant tended to lead them into further unbelief in Christ. So it seemed to be that the more faithful the Jews were to the old covenant, the more it led them from their belief in Christ. This is also true in the Christian faith today. When you have a wrong interpretation of scripture, you can go down the wrong path. Remember, it was the law that kept them from believing in Jesus because they wrongly interpreted what the Old Covenant and the Old Testament said. We have to be careful that we don't let our interpretation of the Bible lead us away from the God of the Bible. Many times we get stuck in the letter but not the spirit and we talk ourselves out of things. We say things like miracles aren't for today, deliverance isn't for today, baptism of the Holy Spirit's not for today, speaking in tongues is not for today. We have all these doctrines that the Bible doesn't teach, that we take the Bible and interpret it a certain way through our lens. We use it in like hometown buffet, choose what we want, take out what we don't want, and then God's power is nullified by our tradition. But you got to understand something. It's not... It's not uh, the word of God that's the problem. It's our interpretation of the word of God. So we need to handle the word of God with great caution, great care and prayer. Paul says, if there is wickedness, it doesn't come from God. God always proves to be true to his promises. To prove his point, Paul is going to quote here uh, a, a, a portion of Psalms in which David is confessing his sin. To understand this quote, we're gonna look at what precedes what Paul is quoting. And this is Psalms 51, three through five. Again, Paul quotes right before this in Psalms 51. And this is David. He says, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. So this is what Paul's quoting right before this. David came face to face with his own sin. And Paul, by quoting this, is hoping that the Jews would come face to face, face to face with their own sin. Paul faced his own sin, as many of us have had to, on his road to Damascus. When I got saved January 12, 2011, the Holy Spirit came upon me. I was faced with my sin and there was an overwhelming guilt of, I can't believe all this time I was doing wrong in the eyes of the Lord. Because I didn't have that conviction before the Holy Ghost came. Type one, if you remember that moment you encountered God and you realized all the dirty talk, all the things you were doing were filthy. You had that moment of clarity and realization that, man, I was wrong the entire time. This is the clarity that David had. 
This is the clarity that Saul had on the road to Damascus. Saul, remember, was commissioned by the Sanhedrin of Jerusalem to go to Damascus and round up the Christians there. And they were to be in prison and await sentencing in Jerusalem. Paul was responsible of Christians being murdered, some of them. Near Damascus, Jesus appeared to Paul, who then was Saul, and asked Paul, why are you persecuting me? Paul was confronted with his sin his terrible mistakes of his past. And that experience dramatically changed his life. From that moment on, Paul was a missionary for Christ. So there is a moment where our sin is right in our face, where God brings it before us, where the conviction comes and where we have to acknowledge it, recognize it, and repent of it, okay? Romans chapter three, if you're wondering where I'm at, I'm in Romans chapter three, verses five through eight. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. Certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil what good may come, as we are slanderously reported and some affirm what we say, their condemnation is just. Again, I know a lot of this sounds complicated. I'm going to break it down very simple. The question Paul is addressing could be rephrased something like this to make it simpler for you. If the darkness of my sin makes the brightness of God's holiness and power brighter, then shouldn't I sin all the more? That's basically what Paul is saying. If God's brightness is illuminated in the depths of my sin by my forgiveness and by what God does in my life, then shouldn't I keep on sinning? But here's the thing. God's holiness can't be brightened. It would be like trying to say, I'm going to make something complete. I'm going to make something that's incompleteness more complete, or I'm going to make something that's already perfect more perfect, or something in wholeness more whole. You can't make something perfect more perfect because it's already perfect. You can't make something complete more complete, and you can't make something whole more whole. And this is what he's saying. Paul's answering the question by drawing from nature and the attributes of God himself. He says, God will judge the world, and God can't judge unjustly. So it's only inadvertently that sin ever brings glory to God. So sin does bring glory to God, but it does it inadvertently because God forgives us. We don't sin so that God could forgive us. God forgives us because we sin. God came to save sinners and he found just ways to accomplish the extraordinary task without changing his nature. So it doesn't change his nature in any way that he forgives us when he's a just God. Because remember, Jesus took on the penalty and it's just for God to forgive us because we stand in the righteousness of Christ. I know it seems kind of complicated. It's not. And I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. It's, It's still, God is still a righteous judge even though he forgives sin because of what Jesus did on the cross. The only reason why sin brings glory to God is because of what Jesus did on the cross. And somehow, in the darkest of our sin, God, get, God gets glorified by forgiving us of those sins. For many of us listening right now, it was that darkness of sin that brought us to the cross in the first place. Satan, remember, is the one that crucified Jesus, brought Jesus to the cross, thinking that this would be the end of Christ, not realizing it was actually all part of God's divine plan. Satan oftentimes overplays his hand by bringing us into the depths of darkness, and those very depths of darkness, come on, chat, are you with me? Those very depths of darkness lead us to the house of God, lead us to the foot of the cross. Many people come to church because they're at the end of the rope and it's at the end of their rope, the foot, they find the foot of the cross and they get changed. So the devil's always overplaying his hand by thrusting us to the cross accidentally. Remember, he brought Jesus to the cross. It was all part of God's plan and God turns into good, even what the enemy means for bad. So for many of us, it's the depth of our sin that brings us to the cross. Romans chapter three, verse nine. What then? Are we bitter than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. So Paul addressed the question that he knew would surface from either the Jews or the Greeks. These are sensitive topics because there's many cultural differences back then. And Paul's trying to throughout the entire epistle neutralize ethnic division. Uh, He's saying this, it's sin that keeps us from God, not race. So like, get out of this whole Jew, Gentile, this race, that race, I'm more special. Paul says, no, I'm erasing that because what's separating you from God is sin. It's not that you're a Gentile or it's not that you're a Jew. Neither of you are connected to God because of your sin. Paul also points out that sinfulness is something that we all have in common, every one of us. Sin is real. 
It is continually present because of fallen nature and Satan's activity. The law can diagnose our sinfulness and the moral illness it produces, but it has no power to cure it. Rather, the law makes us more miserable, showing what is wrong, but offering no solution. It's like having cancer for years and not knowing it. And then one day they say, you have cancer. But sorry, there's absolutely nothing we can do to treat it. You're now more miserable than you were before because you have the knowledge that you have cancer, but no power to change it. We want to escape the law and its clutches, but apart from the intervening grace of God, we lack the power to escape the law. In the final analysis, there's no difference between Greek, uh, Jews and Gentiles. We're all sinners in need of salvation, and the law doesn't have power to change or save it is grace. It's the mercy of God. It's the power of the cross. So the law shows us what's wrong, but the frustration or the wrath of the law, why the law is so frustrating, it's because we can't obey it. it. just shows us what's wrong with no power to obey it. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have come together. They have together become unprofitable. There is no one who do, does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. Their tongue, they practice deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they've not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So up until this point right here, Paul has demonstrated his argument that we've all sinned, okay, every one of us, both Jew and Gentile, but now Paul is going to prove his point by Scripture. The Jews acknowledge that God is present in this re his revelation, and Scripture is God's revelation. This, therefore, would have been the ultimate evidence to his readers that Scripture says no one's righteous. So Paul's doing this. Paul is saying, I'm not just making this up, saying no one's righteous. I'm showing you and quoting Scripture that you guys agree with that nobody's righteous. And this is what we learned from this logic is what I'm saying that Paul being Paul, this is what Paul's saying in his logic. What I'm saying is actually proved by scripture. It is the final word on any matter. Why? Because scripture is from God. That's why. So Paul goes, it's not me saying this. God is saying this through scripture and you guys all acknowledge, right? Not just them, but you guys in the chat that scripture is from God. So if scripture says it, it's not just my opinion. It's also the word of God. Paul is an excellent, excellent, excellent debater and one that brings up these powerful arguments on this stuff. Speaking to Jews that don't believe. Romans 3, 19 through 20. Now we know that whatever the law says... It says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may be guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So let me say the last sentence one more time in Romans um, 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. So just doing the law does not justify you. And then it says, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So Paul sets the stage for a courtroom scene in which People stand before God as judge. When the law is presented detailing the right way to live, the people immediately realize they've not done what God says. They're silent and they have nothing to say in their defense. They know they've broken God's law. Second, Paul makes sure his listeners understand that the law is not going to make them righteous. The law is intended not to save us, but to show us our need for salvation. That's what the law is for. It can't save you, but it shows you the need for salvation. The law can in this way lead us to faith, but this is how the law and faith work in, together instead of oppose each other. So the law does not oppose faith. The law leads us to faith because we say, wow, we're wrong. We need to turn to God. We need to serve God. So the law is not a bad thing, but it's not a saving thing. Type that in the chat. The law is not a bad thing, but it's also not a saving thing. It is by grace. And this is, you got to remember You've been taught your entire life up until this point, the readers of this book of Romans, that the law is what saves you. And here you have Paul saying, I'm sorry to tell you, but that's not what saves you. Jesus is what saves you by grace. So it was not an easy pill to swallow. 
We might wonder why the Jews had such a hard time abandoning their trust in the law. And to understand it, we might look at Acts 17 when Paul visits Athens, a city full of pagan idols, and Apostle Paul preached, and it was obvious that the people in Athens were very religious because there's idols everywhere. And Paul basically says, you're very religious, but you're serving the wrong gods. And the Bible says when he preached to them, they mocked. Others said, we'll hear you again on this matter. Now, it's, it was difficult for people, just think about this, to give up their petty, worthless, powerless idols, okay? How much more difficult would it be for Jews to give up their trust in a holy law that they knew came from God and was the fulfillment of what God said in hopes of a new covenant, which was given by Jesus? So it wasn't an easy thing to give up this idea, just like today, those of you that are religious, that have got raised a certain way, have a hard time giving up your tradition. I know, you know, when I did the sinner's prayer video, people are so mad and they're not mad because it's not because the Bible, because they know it's in the Bible because the Bible doesn't teach the sinner's prayer, period. It's not in the Bible. No one in the Bible said, accept Jesus in your heart and you'll be saved, right? So I preach against that and people get mad. They get mad not because they're scripture, they defend their tradition. So we get mad oftentimes because we're defending tradition, not the word of God. And then we go to the word of God and we're like, oh wait, Jesus never did the sinner's prayer. The disciples never did the sinner's prayer. Maybe it isn't in the Bible. Maybe I'm just defending tradition. They were defending a traditional teaching they learned and rejecting this new covenant that God was bringing. So the law did not create sin. The law revealed sin. God gave the Ten Commandments both to reveal his righteousness and to confront sin. But you got to remember, reading the Ten Commandments does not save you. Observing the law does not save you in itself. The deeds of observing the law can't be saved by just living a good life, obeying the Ten Commandments. There's a lot of people in the world that obey the Ten Commandments, but are not saved. Salvation comes by grace, by putting our faith in Jesus. I wish this was more popular. I wish more people loved doctrine like this. But those of you that are here, praise the Lord. God, God will bless you. Romans 3, 21 through 24. But now the righteous of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and in all who believe. For there's no difference, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So know how Paul begins his section with, but now. What do you, but what do you mean, but now, Paul? You've just demonstrated with reason and scripture that we're all a bunch of guilty sinners who deserve the wrath of God. What on earth, Paul, can you possibly say that you're going to give us hope now? And this is where Paul goes from, we're all under the wrath of God, the law can't save you, to Paul now announces the good news that a righteousness we could never obtain through the law has been made available through different means. And here's the different means. Faith in Jesus Christ will give us the righteousness we need to be saved from our sins. Since all have sinned, it's obvious the only hope for us is to have righteousness credited to our account by someone who has that righteousness. So we can't gain righteousness unless someone who has right standing with God, which is what righteousness means, gives us that righteousness. Okay, so you can't just get righteousness from doing works. And again, righteousness means right standing with God. We have to have someone who has that right standing with God give it to us. And who did that? Jesus. Jesus did that. And now his righteousness is available to anyone that puts their trust in him, not in their self, not in the law, but in Jesus Christ. The grace of God comes freely and nothing in us deserves it. Jesus imputes his righteousness on us when we put our faith in him. And now we can stand before God, not right-ish, because that's what a lot of believers think is like, I'm right-ish, I'm okay, maybe God will let me in. Not right-ish, but righteous, as if we've never sinned before. Thank the Lord. Can we just, for like five seconds, stop right there and thank Jesus for his righteousness that he credited to our account when we could not afford to stand before God justified, but now I can stand just if I'd never sinned before. Not right-ish, but righteous before God with Jesus Christ crediting to our account the righteousness of God because he was in right standing with the Father. Man, that's good preaching. Thank you, Jesus. What could possibly more, be more exciting than that? That is the gospel message. Romans 3, 25 through 26. Whom God set forth, talking of Jesus, okay? Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. 
So here's what it's saying. God has a score to settle. His justice has not been satisfied. He either had to condemn us for our sins or make the costliest sacrifice ever. Those were God's two choices. Condemn these people to death, eternal damnation, separation, hell for their sins. Or God says, I could make, and I just get chills talking about this, man. It's so real. Or God says, I could make the costliest sacrifice ever. And because God loves us so much, we don't know why he does. God made the sacrifice of sending his only son, which did not merely cover our sins, but satisfied all the requirements of justice and the wrath of God and paid the penalty in full. And this kind of sacrifice is known as propitiation. Propitiation, okay? Sounds like a complicated word. It basically means the penalty was paid in full. Man, I love this. That's propitiation. God says, I fully paid, not just covered you, but it's, it's paid in full. Now, this was necessary not only for our sins of the past, present, and future, but also necessary from all sins from the beginning of time till now. So when Paul says in Romans 3.25, because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. He's pointing out to that up to the death of Christ, God let all the sins of humankind go unpunished, which would have been contrary to his nature if he had not eventually presented the sacrifice of Jesus. So all the sins up until Jesus, God allowed those to go unpunished. And then now there is that propitiation for our sins, which was Jesus. God punish, punishes everybody's sin on the crucifixion cross. Okay. So everybody's sin up until Jesus is now put on Jesus and God did not show favoritism to anyone. He let Christ serve as a propitiation so that people who put their faith in him could be justly forgiven. And we have to reflect often on God's sacrifice that Jesus took on the pain of sin, which was the absence of God, not just the pain of sin, but separation from the father, 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 why have you forsaken me? There was a separation that took place at the cross and this is God's love for us. We don't know why. We don't know why anyone that says they know why God loves us. They don't know what they're talking about. The, the love of God is a mystery. We don't know why God loves us so much. He would do this. Redemption is a costly matter. It cost the son of God is life. The old covenant prefigured in its sacrificial system of worship and redemption, the need for blood redemption. Jesus is called the the lamb of God became God's ultimate sacrifice and was made sin for us being the last lamb of God and God's predetermined plan of grace for the entire human race was the lamb of Christ was the lamb of God, which was Jesus. Matthew Henry says this in his commentary, grace comes freely to us, but grace was bought and Christ paid dearly for it. That is a powerful, powerful reality. Grace is free, but Christ paid the ultimate price of his life for that grace. All right, we're doing good. I, I hope we can get through chapter four. Type one in the chat if you'll give me some more time here. Romans 3, 27 through 31. Where is boasting then? Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Let me say that again. Therefore, we conclude this is, this is a, this is essential Christian doctrine. So I want to make sure you get this here. If you're a new believer or whatever, this is, this is the most important video I'm going to make. Okay. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law, or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Paul is mainly talking to the Jews here. We know from verses uh, Romans 2.17 and 2.23 that the Jews had a tendency to boast. And he says, because righteousness comes through faith, not from ourselves, boasting is eliminated. Okay? Because we didn't earn this, we can't brag and say, look what I did, like the Jews would do. So boasting is eliminated, Paul says. Now, Paul anticipated the question and answered that from far from that God is far from nullifying the law. Christians upheld the law because they put it in its rightful place. Again, it's not that the law is bad or sinful. It doesn't cause us to sin. It reveals our sin, but the law is needs to go in its rightful place. And we don't need to think that the law saves us because it doesn't. The law was intended to shut people's boastful mouths before God and to demonstrate utter necessity of faith that we could not do this on our own. The law was not a way of salvation as it was perceived through Judaism. It's not a way of salvation. The law did not save as they thought. Okay, chapter wrap up of chapter three. 
There's nothing in the world system um, that will nullify God's faithfulness towards us. Jew or Gentile, with the law or with conscience, we all deserve condemnation. The law's purpose is to silence us before God. The law brings to us our knowledge of our need for salvation. Jesus was God's propitiation. This means God's justice is fully satisfied by the blood of Jesus Christ. Christ's death, Christ's death is the greatest proof of our need for righteousness. God's way is the only way for sinners to be, to be declared righteous. We have no room to boast because it's only by faith in Christ that we're saved. The rightful place of the law is to show our need for salvation. It is not or was never intended to be a way for salvation. I know it's a lot. I hope I'm keeping it simple and I hope I'm breaking it down. Some of this stuff could get technical, but I'm going to keep continuing by the grace of God to do my best. Okay, chapter four. We got to get through another chapter tonight, guys. We can't just do one chapter or one and a half chapters a week because we'll be, you know, it'll just go way too long. So let's go to chapter four here. Romans chapter four, verses one through two. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, was found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So no, remember, Paul's convincing Jews here. He's talking to Jews. Knowing that the Jews love to boast about Abraham as their father, they'd always say, Abraham's our father. Paul suggests that go, suggested going back to the story of Abraham to see what it said about justification. So remember, the Jewish audience, they love to brag that they are children of Abraham. So the way Paul is going to convince them of their need for God's grace is take them back to the story of Abraham and justification. If Abraham had been justified by works, and by the way, nothing could be farther from the truth, he would have had the right to, to boast only before people, not before God. God is, un, is under any circumstance our master. We're never God's master under any circumstance. God is our master. We are his creatures and our rightful place is to be beneath God. So he's saying if Abraham could boast, which he couldn't, you know it's only that he could boast before man, not before God. No one can boast before God. Romans 4, 3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So Paul is asking a loaded question and he's putting the ball in the Jews court saying, what does the scripture say? He then takes him back to Genesis 15, 6. The moment, the moment Abraham took God at his word, God declared him righteous. Abraham did not do anything to earn this declaration. He simply believed. And this is the doctrine of justification through faith. Okay. Justification through faith says it is by faith I'm justified. And Abraham was counted righteous by his faith, not by his works. Abraham's faith counted him as righteous long before he was circumcised and long before God had given the law to Israel. So it wasn't through Abraham's circumcision or the Abraham getting the law that made him right with God. It was his faith. That's what made him right. This would have been further evidence to the Jews that they were placing unwarranted confidence in the wrong things. Because if circumcision and the law, which were were means to righteousness, then how was your father Abraham, who had never considered righteous, who didn't do either of those things when he was considered righteous? Paul, again, is a genius by doing this because he puts the ball in their court and there's nowhere they can go with it. Paul uses, Paul's use of the scriptural account of Abraham demonstrates righteousness only comes by faith. And again, it's brilliant because of the readers that Paul's writing to. Not only do the Jews reverent scripture to a fault, Abraham was the founder of their race. Jews thought so much of Abraham and they kept a meticulous record just to prove they were Abraham's descendants. And when Paul used Abraham as an example, he made his point with the Jews and he made his point known. Romans 4, 4. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Okay, let me say that again. Sounds, could be confusing here. Romans 4, 4. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. So Paul's making a clear distinction between two things, gifts and wages. Using the analogy of working for wages, Paul is confronting this deception in, in the church that you can earn this, right? So if a man works for a certain wage at the end of the day or the week, he goes to his employer and he gets his paycheck, okay? Is that paycheck, type it in the chat, is the paycheck a gift or is it wages due? For what he did okay obviously he's receiving what is due to him it's a gift he worked for it you don't get your paycheck and say thank you so much for giving me this paycheck how could you do this thank you thank you thank you because you worked for it you didn't earn it so he's receiving what's due to him a paycheck's not a gift it's something you rightly earn but we cannot rightly earn our salvation if we attempt to in any way apply our works to our salvation the truth of the gospel is defiled so anybody that says i did this that's why i'm saved or how i'm saved you're defiling the gospel because it's not by works. It's a gift. It's not wages due. It's the gift of God, okay? 
there's only one work that we can count on. Now there is a work, let me make this clear, there is a work that saves us. There's actually only one work that saves us and that is the work that Christ did on the cross. That's what saves us. What saves us is faith in him, the work he did, not the work that we do. And now it's true, good works will not get you into heaven, but that doesn't mean that works are not important. All right, scripture's clear that faith without works is not good and is no faith at all. So salvation comes, okay, by faith, by grace. You can clip this, you can put it on, all the guys that call me false. It's only by grace, it's only by the faith, by faith that we do this. There's no works involved. Now we're saved. God saves us. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. I respond in being saved. I respond to God. Now I'm a Christian, okay? I'm saved. Thank you, Lord. I have the Spirit of God in me. My response is, now I'm going to work for God. That's my response. I now go from being, so the Bible says, a slave of sin to a slave of righteousness. And now I'm working, not because I have to, but because I get to, because I'm a slave of God. So the works come after salvation, they produce works. And that's why James says, listen, if you have salvation, but you don't have works, you don't truly have salvation. Because if you were really saved, you would work and do this thing and there would be works in your life. So man knows that wages received from work rendered are not a gift. So Paul begins with the obvious and moves to the purpose of his discussion. This is how the gift of righteousness is given, not as, not as a result of man's works, but as a result of God's mercy and grace. The apostle Paul goes back to the moment in history when God imputed righteousness to Abraham apart from any work done by Abraham. In Genesis 15, 6, we read that Abraham believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. That's imputed. He accounts it to him as righteousness. The covenant that God made with Abraham, later known as a later, I'm sorry, Abram, later known as Abraham, as spoken in Genesis 12, is now being enlarged by God so that the promise given would be fulfilled. And the new covenant commentary, Abraham gives a divine perspective. Hebrews 11, 8 through 10 says this, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place, place which he would receive as an inheritance. And when he went out, not knowing where he was going, by faith, he dwelt in the land promised in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which was foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham is God's model of how he sovereignly imparts the gift of righteousness. This is, this is the model. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. That's Romans 3.23. Let me say that again, Romans 3.23. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. This is Paul's message throughout his entire letter. Again, it's true. Works are not your ticket to heaven, but once a person becomes a disciple of Jesus, there will be a heart to serve and be a slave of Christ and to do the works Jesus has called us to do. But what Paul wants to make his readers clear of is that works follow salvation and are not the cause of salvation. Must be, we must be clear on this. Works add no merit to the perfect and all-sufficient merit of Jesus Christ. Jesus did the work, not us. Because of what he did, now we work for God and we serve God. Romans 4, 5 through 8. But to him who does not work but believes on him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So now Paul brings in a second witness, David. He reminds the people in Rome that David speaks of his, the same truth, that faith saves apart from the law. Those who oppose this truth say we must satisfy the justice of God by our works. Here again, we find God crediting righteousness to a Jewish, Jewish forefather apart from his spiritual accomplishments. We know David was blessed, and David, although made mistakes, God counted him righteous. Okay, picture yourself standing before God in heaven's great courtroom. God looks around and says, there's none righteous, no, not one, which is what Paul is saying, okay? There's nobody righteous. What do you say in your defense? You say nothing. You're speechless. You know the judge has spoken something true. Your heart begins to race, and all of a sudden you hear something, and you go, who's that? A lawyer takes his place between you and the judge and looks at you with love in his eyes. He faces the judge and says, may it please the court, Father. The defendant has put his faith not in himself, not in the law, not in riches, but the defendant whom I love has put his faith in me. Very well, the judge says, on the basis of your faith in my son, Jesus Christ, 
I hereby pronounce you not guilty. That is justification by faith, okay? You get justified in the courtroom of heaven, in the courtroom of God on judgment day because you've put your faith in Jesus. Jesus becomes your lawyer. And although you're not righteous, you're not in right standing with God. Jesus says, Father, forgive them. I'll take the penalty. They're justified now. And God says, I'll justify you just as if you'd never sinned because of you putting your faith in Jesus. That's how powerful justification by faith is. And that's a core essential doctrine to the Christian faith. Romans 4, 9 through 11. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or while he was uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness, the faith which he, which he had while still uncircumcised. So the Jews put their faith in the outward sign of circumcision, ignoring that Abraham was counted righteous before he was circumcised. In fact, Abraham was counted righteous 14 or 15 years before he was circumcised. So circumcision was a sign of the covenant, not the covenant. All right, just proving it there again. One commentator said this, okay? Today, baptism serves as a similar function to that which circumcision served in Abraham's day. Baptism is a sign that those baptized belong to Christ, not the world. As with first century Jews and circumcision, people sometimes put too much trust in baptism. Some people think baptism will get them into heaven, but this is not true. Faith is the only thing that can do that. Baptism is only a sign, and apart from faith, it means nothing. Okay? That's what one commentator said. So he says the same way they looked at circumcision, we often treat baptism as the means to salvation. Apart from faith, baptism means nothing. If you go and baptize someone that did not put their faith in Jesus, okay? Say say somebody comes and says, I want to get baptized. They're not a Christian. They've not put their faith in Jesus. And you baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, however you baptize, and they get come out of the water, and, and you think and they think that that baptism saved them, there's no power there. It is only faith in Jesus that get that is a means to salvation just like being circumcised does not save you there's many unbelievers right now that are circumcised like physically they're not saved because of it just like paul is saying here i hope it, made, it makes it clear there romans 4 11 through 12 that he might be the father of all those who believe though they are uncircumcised that that righteousness may be imputed to them also and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision but also walk in the steps of faith which are eight which our, our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. So Paul keeps saying, listen, he was uncircumcised and God counted him righteous. Just like, and I know some of you are going to get mad because you're stuck in religion. And I know that's going to make you even more mad. It's okay. Just like some of you don't think that Cornelius' house was saved even though they weren't baptized. So Abraham counted righteous before he was circumcised. Cornelius' house counted righteous before they were baptized they got the holy ghost before they were baptized they were saved they had the holy spirit then they got baptized so get mad all you want at me that's in the book of acts it's in the bible again they got the holy ghost then they got baptized so baptism is powerful but we keep seeing more proof that it's not the baptism that gets us saved that's it's faith in christ romans 14 i'm sorry romans 4 13 through 15 for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For of those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise of no effect, because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. So God promised Abraham that he would be the heir of the world. In other words, Abraham would be the father of all believers. Paul points out that this would not happen through Abraham's observance of the law. In fact, Abraham disobeyed God several times. It would happen through Abraham's faith. He further points out that because no one can keep the law, the law brings wrath. Now, many of the Jews treasured the law highly. The idea that wrath, the law brought wrath was foreign to them. But this is something that Paul made clear. We're almost done here. Romans 4, 16 through 22. Therefore, it, if it is of, let me say it again, <laughs> getting tongue twisted here. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all in the presence of him who be, he believed God, who gives life to the, de to the dead and calls these things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, 
in hope believed so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken so shall your descendants be and not be weak in faith he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of sarah's womb he did not waver at the promise of god through unbelief but was strengthened in faith giving glory to god and being fully convinced that that which he had promised he was also able to perform and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness okay this is what he's saying all that to say this abraham was too old to have kids. Sarah was too old to bear children. God gave Abraham a promise. You'll be the father of many nations. Abraham had faith in the promise. And because of that faith, God counted him righteous. He became the father of all nations. And again, he had obviously children. So all that is to say, what God says is what is impossible for man, God makes possible. If God makes you a promise, you better believe that God is going to fulfill that promise. And because of our faith, God fulfills the promise. So if you have a promise from God right now, hang on to the promise. God's going to fulfill that promise. If you gave you the word, God will count you as righteous because of your faith. Romans 4, 23 through 25. This is the end here. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus, our Lord from the dead, who was also delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. So this is what Paul is saying. Did you know that Genesis was written for you? It was, Paul says. The assurance that Abraham's faith equaled righteousness is just as much for us as it was for Abraham. So just as God credited Abraham's faith to him as righteousness, he will credit our faith to us as righteousness. Jesus suffered the unspeakable for our sins, he endured being forsaken by his father. If he had not done this, God would have forsaken us forever. Not only are we saved from the penalty of our sin, but also Christ's resurrection gives us an entirely new position before God. If we are in Christ, we are new creations. Christ has imputed his righteousness on us, and we can stand right now, 7, 12 p.m. Pacific time, May 23rd, Isaiah Salvar can stand right now before God, righteous, as if I'd never seen before because Christ imputed his righteousness on us. Abraham's faith transcends time, reminding us of these words. It was accounted to him for righteousness, not for his sake alone, but it was imputed to him also for us. Man, can we get some ones in the chat? That's something to be excited about that God has given us righteousness that right now we're going to pray. And we can stand right here and pray boldly before God. We can approach the throne of grace because of what Jesus did. This is why I love the book of Romans. It's essential core doctrines to the Christian faith that we need to understand. This is so powerful. Let's just recap chapter four and then we're going to pray. Recap, because some of you like this uh, just to catch you up here. Paul pointed out to the Roman Christians that it was Abraham's faith that was credited to him as righteousness, not him observing the law or being circumcised. Wages are not a gift, but a person who works deserves the wages grace is a gift that we can do nothing to earn david wrote poems and songs of all of being forgiven faith and grace forgiveness and justifications are couplets that help explain the vastness of god's love and his matchless plan all these things come together to explain the love of god the great mystery that god loves us so much that he sent his only son why nobody knows the great mystery is this God loves every single one of you in the chat listening, everybody watch, listening to the replay on Spotify, Google, wherever, so incredibly much that he would bankrupt heaven, give everything to send his son to be able to have a relationship with us. I'll, we'll never understand the depths, uh, heights of the love of God that he would do this for us. This is a beautiful thing. You should sleep well tonight knowing that God has imputed righteousness on you because of the work that Jesus did on the cross. This is the gospel message, y'all. It doesn't get any clearer than this. Now you know why scholars consider the book of Romans the most significant historical biblical document because it shows the whole counsel of God and shows the Christian life and the Christian faith. Let us pray now. Father, we thank you so much for what you're doing tonight, Lord. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your anointing. Father, I just thank you for what you did sending your son Jesus to die on that cross, giving us your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord. Come on, let's all pray right now. We thank you, Lord, for what you did. We thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross. And we just pray, Lord, that you would send your Holy Spirit to us, that you would just 
empower us by your spirit that god we would get to know you more that we would draw closer to you god that we would have an appetite for your word that we would have an appetite for prayer that we know god our works don't save us but today we put our faith in you that is only by faith through by grace through faith that we can be saved father we thank you that it's not by works but it's by faith and lord i pray that as we get this understanding that we would produce good works that as we understand that we are forgiven we are justified we are cleansed that we would do good works for you god that we would forever be indebted to you we thank you lord we praise you i pray father over every person in the chat that you would fill them with your holy spirit that right now we ask you for the holy spirit come on just ask him right now for the holy spirit and that you would fill us right now lord with your holy spirit because of what you did on the cross jesus justify us god impute your righteousness on to us we thank you lord for what you've done come on type that in the chat if you're watching on the replay type in the chat thank you lord for what you did on the cross i'm telling you what god has done is so significant and so powerful there's nothing more important in this world than the finished work of the cross that we can't add to salvation there's no works we can do to gain this but jesus did it thank you lord come on type that in the chat thank you jesus for healing our bodies for restoring us, for giving us peace, for healing our marriages, our children, God, for taking our tears, turning them into joy, taking our mourning, mourning and turning it into joy and peace. We'll never forget what you've done, Jesus. We'll honor you, we'll serve you by studying your word and preaching your gospel. Father, tonight, raise up evangelists, raise up those that will do your word, raise up those that will preach your gospel, raise up those that are hungry for righteousness and for your for your uh, your word and your Holy Spirit, God. Raise them up tonight in Jesus' name. I pray you would bless, God, every single person watching this. I pray this word would be blessed, that this seed that went forth tonight would grow and bear much fruit, and it wouldn't come back void. It wouldn't go in the thistles. It wouldn't go on the hard ground. But, God, it would go on the good soil, and that every person watching will never stray, will never wander, but will be consistent in your ways, consistent in your word. We thank you, Lord, that is by faith, that is by grace, it's not our works. You've imputed righteousness on us. We're justified that there has been a full payment for all of our sin, that we can stand before you on judgment day and hear these words, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you guys want to sow into tonight, you can. I'm going to put that up. Um, I'll hang out for a bit here. My voice is gone, as you guys can hear. But if you do want to sow, I, I thought about canceling because I, like, I woke up, I was like, I have no voice. But then I'm like, no, we need to push forward. We need to go hard after God, keep teaching, keep training, keep putting out this content, helping reach people. If you want to help us reach people, maybe you're listening on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, you can give on IsaiahSaldivar.com slash partner. You can give on PayPal.me slash IsaiahSaldivar. You can give Venmo at IsaiahSaldivar. We appreciate everyone that gives. Uh, I never say that for the audio version, but those of you that want to give can. Um, we can't do this without you guys. We can't do this without you guys supporting, you guys sewing. We always say don't nine and dash. If you can afford it, great. If you can't afford it, don't worry about it, okay? If you cannot afford to give, don't stress about it. Enjoy the content. If you're mad that we ask for people to give, then don't give, all right? Just stay for free. So if you're mad, don't give. If you can't afford it, don't give. But if you're able to, if you're a joyful giver, sew into what God is doing. It really helps us out tremendously. Statistically, this is not a guilt trip, you guys, but I want you guys to just see the full picture. So statistically, 1% of people that watch live give. Not watch the replay, not the 3 million people we're reaching every single week on all of our social media platforms. In all the live viewers, so 1,800 of you right now, statistically, 1% will give. And which is, to me, I don't know. I'm like, man, we need to be generous givers. We need to be generous in sowing into these ministries, not just my ministry, but all these other ministries that are blessing us. If you're being blessed by a ministry, whether it's your local church, an online teacher, a book you got, whoever it is, then you should be sowing into that ministry financially. It's a biblical reality. So again, if you don't, then don't. It's all good. Praise the Lord. All right, you can give on IsaiahSaldivar.com slash partner. You can give on Venmo at IsaiahSaldivar. PayPal's there. Zell's there. You can give monthly as well. Pray about that. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to read the chat for a little bit while you guys load up your donations, and then I'll read the donations. And I survived my voice. <laughs> my voice made it. I thought that uh, someone said investing in Isaiah's uh, stocks. Thank you, man. I appreciate you, T-Dog. Um, we're here still. We still have a voice. Praise the Lord. We'll be okay. Thank you, guys. 
Steve-O, you should have got an email when you became a monthly partner. If you monthly partner tonight, you're going to get the email right after. But if you, Steve-O, if you are a monthly partner, I, I personally email every single monthly partner. So you should have got the discount uh, for the clothing. But type your email, Steve-O, and I'll take a picture of it and I will send you it. So go ahead and type your, go ahead and um, type your email there, Steve-O, and I will email you tonight. Check your spam. Most of my time I email people, uh, most of the time I email people, it goes to the spam box. So make sure you check your spam as well. Check that there. Okay. Go ahead and type that Steve-O your email and I will send you that tonight. If you guys see Steve-O's email, type a one or something because the chat's moving quick and I'm trying to see everybody. I'm trying to see everybody's thing. Uh, how does grace fit in with the parable of the talents? The same way James says, if you don't have works, you don't have faith and your faith is dead. The, the reality is this, if you don't have works in your life, you've probably truly never been saved. So gr the uh, salvation's free and we gain salvation freely, but when we work out our salvation through fear and trembling and there's works in our life, it proves that we've received true salvation. We're truly saved. So works prove that we've attained salvation because you don't get saved and then just become lazy. If that's you, then you didn't truly get saved and you're not truly born again. But again, works don't gain us our salvation. So yes, yeah, Steve-O, whenever you can, type in your email and I will send you that tonight. And check your spam box too, okay? All right, I'll be looking for his thing as you guys give. Again, thank you guys for giving. We always say don't dine and dash. If you're not a monthly partner, become one. It helps such tremendously. Most of us monthly partner with Netflix. We monthly partner with Apple Music. We monthly partner with Spotify. We monthly partner with YouTube Premium. We monthly partner with Starbucks. So monthly partner with ministry. It doesn't have to be mine but partner with somebody's ministry, support somebody's work. All right. I don't see you, Steve-O. Where are you, Steve-O? Give me your email, brother. Excuse me, guys, so that I can send that out to you. I'm going to look here for... I'm reading all the comments here. As you guys load your giving, and then I'll read the donations after. Again, thank you to everybody that's supporting us and that's continued to support us for so long. And uh, we don't have any plans of slowing down or stopping we're just going to keep praying, reading, studying, and pouring our life out here on social media. I mean, you guys are our family. It means a lot. We're laying our life down and sacrificing to this thing. So how much is it a month? There's no limit. You can give a cent. You can give a dollar. You can give a hundred, whatever you want. There's no, there's no thresholds. There's no requirements. All right. I don't see Steve-O's thing. If he ever does type, then you guys can copy it and post it or whatever, or say, Hey, he typed and I'll look at the comments. But I'm going to read the donations now because I don't see Steve's comment. And then I'll read all the comments. So whatever you want to tell me, awesome. When's the Life Song yesterday? We were blessed by the service in the church. God is awesome. Thank you, Nancy. I'm glad you came. We had an awesome time at Life Song yesterday. Amazing, amazing four services were just, it was awesome. Thank you to all of you that came out. Okay, Hannah Scott, I love your messages. Thank you. Can you please, I got your prayer request there. Thank you so much, Hannah Scott. I won't, I won't read your prayer request out loud as I try to not ever read prayer requests out loud because some of them are private thank you hannah scott um okay hannah i got your email there i'll email you that again make sure that you check your spam hannah okay because i can't control if my email goes to your guys' spam or your junk so i'll email you right there hannah i got the other email someone posted earlier and then i'll make sure that i send that out again to you but please make sure you check your spam as well whitney nyland this was such a great teaching your champ doing this even with, without a voice. It almost sounded better the longer you preached. Praise God is healing on it tomorrow might be different. Thank you, Whitney Nyland. I appreciate you. I actually, I actually don't mind. I, I actually like the way my voice sounds better when I don't have a voice, but it's harder when I don't have a voice because I have to strain and use a lot more energy because my voice is gone. But yes, T-Dog said investing in Isaiah Stonks. Thank you, T-Dog. I appreciate you so much. Warren and Donna. Thank you, Isaiah, for another awesome teaching. Thank you, Warren and Donna. Appreciate you. Clinton Terriano. God bless you, Isaiah, and your family. Listen, Isaiah, I would be greatly appreciated if you invite TJ to the Demon Slayer podcast, please. Thank you, Clinton Terriano. I appreciate you. Unfortunately, I can do more than four, and I think more than four people is too much on one podcast. I think five is just tips over the edge. Um, even with four people, like the um, even with four people, everybody gets, you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes to talk during a, a broadcast. So five is just. I think too many people, but TJ is definitely a demon slayer. Thank you, Clint. Connor Williford 
said, so I recently received tongues. I think at my church this Sunday and just wanted to ask, can tongues be super repetitive in words and such? Like I'm almost 100% sure it's tongues, but it's very repetitive. Also, it can't flow as long as I did at church. Connor, yeah, it could be repetitive. Um, it doesn't have to be different all the time. Everyone's tongues are different. So yeah, it definitely could be repetitive. I wouldn't doubt that you got tongues. If you ask for the Holy Spirit, God will usually give us something. One way to know if your tongues are real is when you're speaking in tongues, you don't have to think about it. It just, you open your mouth in faith and speak out, but you're not thinking about the words before you say them. So if you find yourself, you know, thinking about the words you're going to say before you say it, it may be, um, it may not be that you're speaking in tongues, but I don't want anyone to doubt their tongues. I just, that's kind of just a thought there. Ray said, how's your day going? It's going good, Ray. Thank you. This message had me vulnerable. Jesus uh, could have died for us by stoning, but he decided to go through one of the most excruciating deaths possible. Thank you for putting this, for pushing through, Isaiah. Thank you, Ray. Amen. Tonight was amazing. The word of God is so powerful. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Sassy Fence said, love you, brother. Hope your voice gets better soon. Shout out to the Discord server, Commission and Nickmo. I'm watching. Love y'all. Yeah, shout out to Discord. If you're not in the Discord, jump in there. Thank you, Commission, for being so awesome on the Discord and all you guys helping run it and uh, all the mods. You guys are amazing. Nobody gets paid to do the Discord. It's all just by love that people mod and are on there. So thank you guys. Appreciate it. Awesome. VSG said, your del uh, deliverances have changed my life forever. I can't thank you enough for your ministry. Thank you, VSG Life. All glory to God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Sarah Houston. Houston. So thank you so much, Isaiah. I wish I could give more. This is all I can manage. May God always bless you and your family. Also, your girls are precious. Thank you, Sarah. And don't feel bad at all. Thank you. No need to apologize. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Patty. So I'm forgiven by a faithful God. Thank you, Patty. Ross and Hillary Thomas. So thanks for your messages. We appreciate your heart helping others. Thank you, Ross and Hillary. Antonio said, God bless you, Isaiah. Uh, or Lord bless Isaiah's family. Thank you for all you do. Thank you, Antonio. Jeremy Split. So thanks, Isaiah, for your live streams and your hard work. God bless. Thank you, Jeremy. Jeanette Garcia, thank you. And our Anonymous, thank you. Okay, that's all the Vedmo tonight. Thank you guys again. Let me... I'm sorry. That's all the PayPal. <laughs> My brain, guys. I'm, I'm not going to lie, guys. Those four services on Sunday, they take a lot out of you. I wake up and I just am like, everything, I'm empty, right? So I'm a little bit... My head's a little bit all over the place. But we did the PayPal... Let me read the Venmo here. Again, if you're giving on Venmo, the website, PayPal Monthly, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Can't say it enough. We couldn't do this without you guys. I'm serious. Um, Let's see. Excuse me. Tommy Wilson, thank you so much. Valerie Pay Payen, thank you so much. Esmeralda Tussing, thank you. Ryan Connor, thank you. Amanda Sutton, so I was asleep until I spent three months on a mission in India and got a crash course in deliverance ministry. Coming back to the U.S. where deliverance isn't taught was so difficult. Pray for God. I praise God for your ministry. Time for the Western church to wake up. Thank you, Amanda Sutton. Which I want to also just make a very, a very real statement here. I know you guys see people bash me online for deliverance or make YouTube's video about me, how I believe in deliverance. I'm crazy. Just so you know, deliverance is normal in most of the world. The Western church and the Church of Canada and then some other areas are the ones that argue deliverance and don't believe it. But the rest of the world, India, Africa, China, they do and believe in deliverance and they think we're crazy for not believing in it. So whenever you have the temptation to not believe in deliverance or listen to these guys that argue it, just realize it's a Western theology. It's not biblical. Most of the international Christian world believes in casting out demons and nobody argues it. And they laugh at us when we argue about it. Like, why are you guys arguing about casting out demons? Of course it's biblical. Of course it's for today. So yeah. We got to get out of that westernized thinking. Richard Montana is. In fact, no one internationally has ever made a video about me that I'm false. Only people in the U.S. or Canada make videos because, again, it's a very western, watered-down gospel that teaches deliverance isn't for today. Caroline Boneham, thank you. Richard Montana said, thanks so much. God is using you tremendously. Thank you, Richard. Ariana Martinez said, thanks so much for your content. Thank you, Ariana. Velda. Oh, no, no, no. Where'd you go? My lips are so dry. Velda Anderson, thank you. Blanca, Blanca said the word. Thank you, Blanca. No, Venmo, stop. Tatiana said, thanks so much. Oh, why are you doing that, Venmo? Said, thanks so much for serving the Lord. You blessed me with your preaching night, and you always do. I hope to, I hope to get deliverance from you one day and meet you in person. God bless you and family. Much love, brother. Glory to God. Thank you, Tatiana. Jennifer Venegas said, teaching on the book of Romans. Thank you. Lisa Bergerino said, God bless you and family for all the sacrifice, preaching, and always bring the glory to God. You have a pure and beautiful heart. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate you. Diane Stevens. Say, God bless your ministry and your family. Voice sounds great. Keep up the good work. Love everyone. Thank you, Diane Stevens. We love and appreciate you. Nancy Torres said, God bless. Thank you, Nancy. Marissa Christensen said, you're a warrior. Thank you. Lucy Zab, thank you so much. Said, for dinner. Thank you, Lucy. Jennifer Diaz said, God bless you, brother. Thank you for pushing through even with no voice. We appreciate it. Um, 
My son, Jeremy19, recently went through Zoom deliverance with someone from your map. It was awesome. Praise God. I want to do it too. How beautiful freedom is in Jesus. Thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate you. Thank you, guys. Everyone giving on Venmo. Let me make sure there's nobody else here. Okay, I think that's it. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right. Let's see. All right, Pablo Felix, powerful word Isaiah recently started my lawn business, named it Revival Lawn Care. Wanted to ask you if you can pray over it just so God can expand it. Jesus, thank you and God bless. Pablo Felix, thank you for the donation. Father, we pray you would bless the Revival Lawn Care. And Lord, I pray you would prosper this business as it sows into ministry. Use them as a conduit of finances. God bless this ministry. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Pablo Felix. I appreciate that. Michael and Judy Sinclair, thank you guys for the donation. We love you, Mike and Judy Sinclair. I saw you guys at church yesterday. Love you guys and appreciate you guys. You guys are awesome. I love the work that God is doing in the Sinclair family. God is on the move. Amen. Bishop Franklin uh, Del Delanor said, Shalom, double portion, Jubilee, covenant, fruits, inheritance, blessing, release. Thank you, Bishop Franklin, for the donation. I appreciate you. Bless you. Shalom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let us look here. Is Sabbath works? I wouldn't say it's works, um, but Sabbath, keeping the Sabbath does not keep you saved. Does not get you saved or is not keeping the law in the new covenant. All right, some of you are still behind saying, thank you, Lord. I see that. A lot of people watch it and they re rewind it even though they're 30 minutes in. So if you look at the chat, you're like, that doesn't make sense. It's because they're way back watching me preach 20 minutes ago, okay? All right. Someone said, if you're considering sewing monthly, this is your sign to do so. You won't regret it. Sermons are fire. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Evangelist John. I appreciate you. Go drink some hot tea and honey. I'll try that, Wanda. Thank you. Maybe I'll do that after. Maybe. What size shirt do you wear? Small. I'm a men's small. I'm I'm skinny, y'all. I'm men's, I'm men's small. For sure. It's for your physical and mental health. Get some rest. Praise the Lord. John the Baptist was... The greater than the prophets, eh? I don't know what that means. Will you please pray for soccer dribbler? Uh, I don't know what that means, but yes, I will. Audrey Gamble, thank you. So praying for your voice. Thank you for the tenacity to push, push through. Anyway, Firestream is always love you, bro. Thank you, Aubrey. Love you and appreciate you, Aubrey Gamble. You're a legend. Yeah, these last two chapters in Romans were a bit complex. So I was like, man, I'm doing my best to break them down, make it... One of the biggest compliments I get is when people say, man, you make the word make sense. You make it easy to understand. I've always read this and it never made sense, but you made it easy. So I just pray that. I don't want it to be more complicated. I try not to use these big words. I want it to just be very simple. So what do you eat on a normal basis? Uh, I don't eat very much. That's the problem. But I don't know, whatever. Whatever normal people eat. I'm pretty basic. Sandwiches, pizza, I don't know. Basic stuff. Mexican food, Italian food normal food peanut butter and jelly i don't know thank you for tonight thank you crystal i appreciate you i'll probably stay on guys for just a couple more minutes here and then i'll get off so that my voice can rest that's why okay tomorrow night six o'clock we're going over soul ties with me pastor mike signorelli and pastor vlad sapchik it's going to be good demon slayers tomorrow night mm -mm -mm. how are the girls they're doing good i can hear them yelling and running around right now so they're doing something are you still pre-tribulation? No, I'm post-tribulation. I have a video on my channel of me and Dr. Brown and why I'm post-tribulation rapture. Are you still taking PayPal's? Yeah, you can give on at PayPal at any time. It's always open. No, no, no. How was the holiday? Oh, it was good. I took five days off and then went back and been running hard ever since since we went to texas also next week we have our yearly family camping trip so there'll be no podcast next week so i'm taking tuesday to sunday off i will have some content posted throughout the week and i will have other stuff being done but i will be camping from tuesday to sunday our yearly camping trip is going to be next week no podcast next week but i will be here for monday okay so i'll be here monday and then i'll leave tuesday morning camping Someone said Taco Bell is a no. I like Taco Bell certain times when they have like special items that I like. But um, yeah, they have to have certain things that I like there. And they have like the seasonal items that come out that are really good. Then they go away. That's the time I like to eat Taco Bell. John and Lex, thank you. Anonymous said, God bless me with a new job. I just got paid for my first six hours. I know this money doesn't go far in California. I hope you have a blessed day though. Thank you, Anonymous. I appreciate you. I've never gone camping. Is it fun? Yes, it's amazing. I love camping.
Yes, yes, yes. I would tell you where I'm going camping, but I don't want you guys to show up and be weird, so I'm not going to. There's too many people online that have weird intentions and do weird things, so... I found that out when my address got leaked and people were doing weird stuff and getting pizzas delivered in my house and all this other weird stuff, so... We don't do that. I don't tell people where I live and I don't tell people where I'm going on vacation or camping or anything like that. Tans, so thanks for all that you do. God bless you and your beautiful family. Thank you, Tans. I love you guys, but some of you are, are too weird. You do weird stuff. Do you still go fishing? Not really, but I probably will while we're camping. But no, I haven't been fishing in a long time. Yeah, people are just weird sometimes. And you got to remember, like when the whole pizza thing happened, the cops are like, do people not, like who doesn't like you? I was like, well, the devil doesn't like me. That's all I know because I cast out demons. But I don't know anyone who wouldn't like me. Adriana Martinez. Someone said, here's my address. Send me food. No, Liz, here's what they were doing. They weren't sending me food. They were ordering pizzas. I'll take, you know, five pizzas to this house. And then the pizza delivery came and was like, all right, here's your pizza. Where's the money? It was, it was a prank. It wasn't like them paying for the pizza. We had like five pizza delivery places while I was live streaming at my house. And I had to call every single pizza place in my city and get blacklisted from getting pizza delivery. So it wasn't a good thing. It wasn't like they were trying to send me food to be nice. It was them trying to troll me and be rude. So yeah, that's what happened. And uh, that's why my address, I will not put my address out. Anyways, that's a whole nother story. What's your stance on firearms? I don't think there's anything wrong with firearms. As a minister, do you find it hard to take time off? Uh, not really. Not really. I used to, but not really, not anymore. I have to take time off more than I did last year and be more intentional in what I'm going to do this year. I used to be like, if I don't stream or if I don't upload, everyone's going to leave and I won't, you know, I just had all these thoughts and now I'm like, I'm at the point where I just have to be intentional and be like, hey, I'm taking next week off. Hey, I'm taking this day off from streaming because it is very, very consuming and it's healthier to take time off than to just burn out, right? So, yes. Why don't, why you don't keep the Sabbath? Who said I don't keep the Sabbath? Free spirit. Who said that? Uh, Facebook doesn't hate me. They just have a lot of rules and censorship more than any other platform. This feels like a family. That's because it is a family. What do you think about taking protein supplements for weightlifting? Uh, that's great. Take them. There's nothing wrong with protein powder or anything. We won't leave you. Thank you, Stacy. I appreciate you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I love you guys. I'm going to jump off here. I usually will stay on for another 20 or 30 minutes, but I'm already hoarse as it is. So I love you guys. I'm glad you enjoyed tonight. Thank you for giving. If you still want to give, you can. The links to give are there and you can give on monthly or whatever. Love you guys. I will see you tomorrow night, six o'clock. Hopefully my voice is back. If not, we'll still be here. See you guys. Love you. Bye. See ya. Have a good night. Bye. Love you guys. Thank you guys for being here. We are working on getting verified soon on Instagram. It is a very hard process to become verified, but we're going to be verified soon. Hopefully that helps with all the scammers. But yes, do not send money to WhatsApp. I do not have a WhatsApp. I do not have an orphanage. And I, um, I will never message you asking for money. So see you guys tomorrow. Love you guys. Good night. I'll be in Florida in July. Good night, guys.